Hi, I'm Mary with Insect Shield, and I'm here with Dr. Tom Mather of the University of Rhode Island Tick Encounter Resource Center. Um, and Tom is our resident tick expert. Uh, Tom, can you introduce yourself and tell us about your background? Yeah, sure. So I'm Dr. Tom Mather, but you know, some people don't necessarily remember names like that, but they almost always remember, oh, you're the tick guy. Um, and so I've decided years ago to just let that go. And I will just be the tick guy for people. And um, everybody needs a tick guy in the world these days, don't you think, Mary? Oh, yeah, I think so. Definitely. Uh, there's a lot to learn about ticks. And I hope today we're going to learn some new things um, kind of beyond just the basic prevention, which we can touch upon. Uh, but we have a lot of resources um, at our Equip for Ticks uh, website, which you are expert, and also, of course, at uh, at tickencounter.org, you have all sorts of resources, and that's that's your mission. Um, so, one thing I wanted to talk about, you know, we know ticks are have a lot of carry diseases. How do they get? How do they become carriers? And how are the different phases? So, there's there's three phases of tick yeah, life. Yeah, so there's a there's a lot to unpack in that okay. question there, Mary. Yeah. So well, let's start. I I actually just gave a lecture to my um, class, and we were we started with reservoirs, and maybe I should have started with ticks. So these are two different things. So people don't. It turned out the students didn't know what a reservoir was. They were thinking of the pond up the road that where the, their water came from. But in the context of diseases caused by ticks. Ticks get their germs from wildlife, and um, wildlife carry different germs, and ticks can pick up different germs, depends on the type of tick. And so we can sort of get into that in, in a minute. But, you know, all ticks come in small, medium, and large sizes. And when they are attached and feeding, they get supersized. So small, medium, and large. And there's one extra stage in that life cycle, and that is the small ones come from eggs. So there's eggs, small ones we call larvae, medium ones we call nymphs, and the large ones we call adults. And adults come in two flavors, male and female. And so well, most ticks do that. There's actually one tick that we could talk about, Asian longhorn ticks, that only <laughs> Only have females. Oh, but, um, okay. Yeah, curious. Yes. Anyway, so there's a lot of cool things going on with, with ticks. And um, we have small, medium, and large ticks. People are like, how are you ever going to see that small one? It's the size of a, of a salt grain, you know. And so that's an issue for people. You know, the nymph is likened to the size of a poppy seed on a bagel. And that's kind of small when you think about that we tried to teach people that they they need to just adjust their eyes right when mm. they're looking they have to know what they're looking for and so these different types and stages of ticks come in different locations in America and they also come at different times of the year so um, at Tick Encounter we have um, five core things that we think people should know and do. And one of them, and I think the most important one, a good place to start, is everyone should know the types of ticks that occur where they live right. and when they're active. So, and that's not going to be the same for every place. And so in the springtime, I often am interviewed by um, different media sources, mm -hmm. and they almost always start with, how bad are the ticks going to be this year? And most of my colleagues, probably knowing that they won't be wrong, will say, oh, they're going to be bad because generally speaking, one tick is one too many for most people. And right. so they're, they're always going to be right that they're bad if they get one tick. Well, it was bad. See, I told you it was bad. But I, years ago, I started stopping the reporter right there and I said, whoa, whoa, you know, we need to unpack that question, how, tick, how bad are ticks going to be this year? Because um, it depends on what tick you're talking about and where your where where your publication is going to be viewed because different ticks have different stages at different times of the year and um, it is true that May tends to be the tickiest month of the year mm. in general across all of North America but outside of that if you're trying to say well you know so actually sometimes ticks won't be so bad at that time of the year like 
you're planning your vacation already for August. Well, guess what? That's actually one of the least tickiest times Mm. of the year. Yet people think, oh, how can that be? It's summertime. Everything that bites is worse in August. Mosquitoes are worse in August. They more likely to transmit diseases in August. Well, it turns out that's a time of the year in the tick life cycle that the larval stage, the tiny one, the littlest one, the small, medium, and large, the smallest one, are active. And one, they're not generally carrying germs. And two, they're so small people can't see them anyway. They may be there, but they people may are less likely to get them or see them even on them if they did get them, but it doesn't matter because they're not likely to be carrying germs either. Right, and that's, so the larval ones, why are they, then they're unlikely to be carrying germs because they have not found a host to get germs from. Is that right? Exactly. So most ticks um, hatch out of their eggs, pathogen-free, without any germs. There are a couple of, there's always some exceptions to the rule, right? And so there are a couple um, germs that actually do pass through the egg to the, mm. the larvae, okay. but um, they're not the most common ones. Certainly Lyme disease, which is what most people are concerned about, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease does not do that, okay. doesn't pass through the egg. So in order for a tick to become infected, it has to bite a host. That is what we call a reservoir, uh, an animal okay. that's not that's only carry, okay. carrying the germs, but has to be is capable of giving it up, giving up their infection. So some animals stingily hold on to their infections. They don't pass it along to every tick that comes along, but they may pass it along. One one specific kind of tick may be able to fish it out of the reservoir and, and become infected, whereas others don't. And that's kind of an interesting situation. So like we see that with the three most common ticks in, in America are the American dog tick, the black-legged tick, and the Western black-legged tick on the on the West Coast, and Lone Star ticks. Those are the, the mm. most common ticks people and pets get. And it turns out that black-legged ticks can fish the, the um, Lyme disease bacteria out of their reservoir, usually a small rodent, like a mouse or a chipmunk or something. But American dog ticks and Lone Star ticks feeding on exactly the same host don't become infected. Interesting. So so that's where we've come down. Actually, we've just recently written a blog um, called Different Ticks Transmit Different Germs. Different ticks, different germs. Right. And even if it's the same host. Even if it's the same host. In fact, when I did the experiments back in um, 1990, it was published we put all the larvae of all three of those species of ticks on the exact same mouse and let them feed. And then we looked to see which ones became infected and only the black legged ticks um, became infected to a point where they could transmit the germ in their next blood meal. The American dog ticks and the Lone Star ticks, um, they might've ingested contaminated blood, but they didn't become infected themselves. Huh. And so they weren't able to transmit it. And that's for Lyme. Because they, that's they will for Lyme transmit disease. Other. So let me ask. So, okay. So the larval tick, say a black legged tick finds a, de- it's a, it's a larval stage. It's looking for food, blood, because yep. they feed bloods, their food gets on a deer feeds, gets the Bacteria in them and gets the line. Now I've got to I've got to stop okay. you there, okay. Mary. So yes. it depends on so that the definition of the word reservoir, so okay. where the germs come from, um, depends. Like certainly, deer are infected, but they don't get a enough of a uh, they don't give a tick enough of a dose for the tick to become infected. So we call them incompetent as a reservoir. So they're certainly infected, but not infective to ticks Ah. feeding on them. But other animals are, um, in particular, white-footed mice, which are ubiquitous in our landscapes. Um, Chipmunks are pretty common as well. Squirrels, also common. Certain species of birds, also capable of not only being infected, but being infective when ticks are feeding on them as well. So there's a really important distinction to make. That is, because I mean, one thing too, I'm in well, I'm in um, North Carolina, but grew up in Maryland and there's just deer everywhere and everyone's 
there's people they're blaming deer for Lyme disease. So is that well, so so that's okay. They they can because okay. What deer do is they give the adult stage tick their blood meal so that they can lay 1,500 to 3,000 eggs to make all of those larvae that then feed on reservoir competent animals like chipmunks and mice. Okay. But so without the deer in the, in the whole life cycle of the tick, we wouldn't probably have as many ticks and then there would be less okay. ticks getting germs and less germs coming into people as well. Okay. So the deer have an important role. Okay. We call them, instead of a reservoir host, we call them a reproductive host. Oh, so okay. reproductive for the ticks. But they're not spreading exactly. the deer themselves. Not, okay. I, that's In fact, if any I larvae know. get on the deer, yeah. they end up taking a blood meal that is not infected. And those end up being the uninfected ticks in the environment. Okay. So those are almost the good ones. So then, okay. So then, and so say we've, so it's found almost a, good. I don't know that we go down that road too <laughs> okay, far. Okay. <laughs> but then, so we have, so, okay. So they fed, so let's say they had, they found a mouse that was infective. They had their first meal. Then they drop off of the mouse. They do. So those larvae, remember, we just mentioned yep. that August was a time that they're active. So the, um, you know, I know most people like to think of a calendar starting in January and going from well, there. Well, we can but, go for the school year. Yeah, so we're going to go. Good. We're going to we're going to go August. Okay. And in August, almost every mouse in the no woods in the Northeast, at least, um, are infected with Lyme disease germ. Why is that? Because the preceding springtime and summer, they were being fed on by nymphs, and the nymphs would then be carrying the germ to, and then. They keep having new mice, of course, right? Mice just keep breeding and breeding. And so by August, you have not only a large population of mice, but almost all of them had been infected just a month or two earlier by the earlier state, the, the older stage of the tick. So, so, so they, now these, they kind of put it back and forth. So like Exactly. The, so the larvae then are busy picking up germs um, from these mice. And if it's the Lyme disease germ, they're, you know, a very high number of them become in infected. So it turns out then they drop off of the mouse and go through the winter and come out as the next stage, which is that middle stage called the nymph, the following springtime. So what's the typical lifespan of a tick? So these black-legged ticks in the eastern United States and you know, even in the Western United States, the Western black-legged tick, they they generally take two years to go through their entire cycle because of that, that the, you know, the larvae starting in the fall, they pass through the winter. The, in the springtime, the second stage comes out, the nymphs, then they feed and then they get a blood meal. They also potentially have transmitted germs, but then they become the adults of that following fall. So the you know, the, the nymphs in the spring become the adults in the fall. The adults in the fall get on deer, get enough of a blood meal. They fall off of the deer and then they lay their eggs and those eggs hatch again the following spring. So you think about it, the, in the fall, the stage that's at the, the end of the summer, the stage that's active is the larvae. In the fall, the stage that's active is the adult in the early spring, the leftover adults are active. So as soon as it warms up enough for ticks to move their little legs. And then in the springtime, the nymphs come out and um, they become then the next fall's adults. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's a two year, goes two years to get through the whole life cycle. And then, okay. So then, well, one thing for reproduction, is there like, like, I mean, because there's male and female ticks, like, is, is there like tick sex happening? Like, how's that? How's the reproduction? Yeah, so that <laughs> really gets kind of spicy okay. um, when we talk about black-legged ticks. There's there's really, in the tick world, there's two different kinds. We call them prostriate ticks and metastriate ticks. Okay. You don't need to remember that. The, the prostriate ticks, though, are all of the ticks that are in the genus that starts with Ixodes. Ixodes is the one that the black-legged ticks are mm. as well. And so those ticks um, are fairly randy and they will mate off of the host. The other kind of ticks called the metastriate ticks, actually, in order for the male to become potent, um, the male, 
um, it has to actually attach to the host and feed just a little bit. It doesn't engorge like a female tick does, but it has to attach so that those ticks like American dog ticks and Lone Star ticks, they they will, um, the female will attach to the host. The male will be wandering around the host. And when it senses where the female is, it partners up next to it, but bites next to it. And then they can pass their sperm sort of gotcha. across that little gap that the black-legged ticks do it differently. They, In fact, you can find them mating on the bushes um, sometimes, um, which shows that the males don't really need a blood meal mm. for their sperm to be activated. And um, so there, there is a little bit of a difference there. But the males uh, of the black-legged ticks don't really, they, they might seem like they're latching on. They're really just kind of holding on, hoping that the, they'll be around when a female comes to the host right. and then they, they can go and mate with it. So you do find male and female black-legged ticks mating on hosts, but they um, also are mating off hosts. Okay. Interesting. So, anyway. Okay, so I guess then, okay, but again, going back to, you know, people avoiding ticks. So you said it's really in May when we have the the nymph, those are the ones that people should be most concerned about. Well, so they, they, they actually aren't as infected, okay. as highly infected as the adults, but they're small and people don't see them. Mm -hmm. And so that, that makes it really problematic. So they generally come out in, you know, in May and then they're active in May and June and into July. And usually by the end of July, it's, it's become hotter and drier in most locations and they're, they're very sensitive to drying out. Mm -hmm. And so if they, if they dry out, then, then they die. But if we happen to have a wet, you know, and so we could be looking ahead at, you know, what the, what's going on with the climate change situation. If we start in certain locations, you know, start experiencing wetter and, and um, more moist late summers, like August, these ticks can survive, you know, in the laboratory, we can keep them for a year in our incubator under ideal humidity conditions. So it's not like it's impossible for them to survive. It's just that they, they often run into dry drying conditions and mm. then sort of peter out by the end of the summer by actually by in july um, we start usually getting but it, there's going to be places where you know like up against the the shenandoah ridge along the appalachian trail for instance it's it's cooler and moister and it may be slightly more moist for those ticks to survive a little longer so it, it's a rule of thumb of when these ticks are but there's going to be certain places where people are still going to be at risk. And mm. so it's kind of important to remember that. But they, those nymphs come out in, in generally in May and June and into July. And that's, you know, if it was that they extended, that people would be getting more disease because then those nymphs are hard to see mm. and more people are out in July and August than are out in May and, and June just because school and people aren't going to camps where they're outside and in the woods and stuff. So it's actually a lucky thing right. that the nymphs kind of truncate their their season of activity in July. And maybe it's a bit of a surprise for people listening to this that actually if if you are um, doing an outdoor camping trip, August is actually more likely to be a safer time for you mm. than than July. Okay, so then okay, so then going back to then the protection at different times of Kind of the this the phases. So we talked about the most of the larval, they have not had a blood meal. So they will not transmit disease. They can cause some discomfort. I think we were recently together and one of our colleagues actually had a run in with some <laughs> of the larval and came home after <laughs> tick hunting and had what she thought was, you know, developed freckles all over her body. But so there was no worry of disease in that case, but it's well, uh, so yeah, so disease. Yeah, disease caused by germs. In her case, the the bites themselves um, elicited sort of an allergic reaction, right. so it was a bit itchy for her. Right. So then yeah. that, and then so when we're going out, the other times of year, one thing I think because I've heard you say like you have to think like like an animal. So depending on the tick you're worried about, where where they're going to be, if they're one really looking for like a mouse and they're super low, or maybe they're looking for a raccoon so they could be a little bit higher in the brush like how does 
how do the different ticks, like what are they looking for and how does that affect how yeah, we so that, protect ourselves? You know, I, I like that story because a lot of times people think, oh, ticks fall out of trees onto their head. Why did they think that? Because the American dog tick, being a big, robust tick, latches on and crawls up. All ticks crawl up because the skin is thinner on not just human heads, but in on animals as well. And it's easier for them to put their little mouth part through thinner skin and suck blood, right? So the ones that didn't do that didn't get a good blood meal and sort of have been lost to natural selection over eons of time. But the ones, so you can just think that in order to, you know, we're seeing now sort of the 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 war that went on between animals and ticks and the ones that were successful were not the ones that spent all of their energy climbing up 20 feet into a tree to cross across a limb, wait for the exact right host to walk exactly underneath of them because they, they don't have wings right. and actually they don't have eyes, so they can't actually <laughs> see. And so, and they don't have anything to measure which way the wind is blowing. So it was, those ticks have been lost through evolution a long time ago, the ones that decided that the best strategy for them to find a host was to climb up a tree. You know, remember how small these things are. Yeah, that crawl, across a, a long time. crawl across Miles. a limb yeah. only to jump and miss and have to go through that yeah. process yeah. again, right? Those are, those are long gone dead. The ones that have been successful have figured out what's the animal that I do best at stealing blood from. They don't care about the germs. They right. only want the blood because that's how they're going to grow to the next stage or grow so that they can lay eggs, right? And so how, which is the animal that I'm going to succeed best on? And what's going to be my best way of getting on them? So clearly, if you are a larval stage tick and you are like most of these larvae, they come out of one egg batch. So the female tick lays one egg, egg batch it was on a deer. So you can find these engorged ticks in deer beds. All of the eggs hatch in one little quarter-sized um, area. Let's say there were, you know, on that deer, there wasn't just one engorged tick, but there were six or eight or 10. Just think of that, you know, 18,000 larvae all in the space of, you know, two or three feet where the deer was bedding down. And so now the unfortunate mouse that runs through that spot, right? So you can think of a, a scurrying animal that's, you know, not, they're going to be on the ground in going through the leaves. And that's exactly where these ticks are going to latch on. And so if you were a deer, all that those little larvae would see of you are four pencil points walking through the leaf litter, right? Not very much to grab hold of, right. but the, the mouse or the chipmunk that's they're so low yeah like they're flipping the leaves and right, everything right. kind of looking for nuts and stuff they're the ones that are going to get it so those larvae have just figured out hey i'm going to stay right here in the leaf litter where it's nice and humid and i know those stupid mice are going to run through here eventually and you know and there's a lot of us so we're going to you know swarm the guy and um, that's generally what happens usually you don't find just one or two larvae on a mouse or on a person. Usually in the case of our colleague, you know, she had hundreds of them. So she ran into a whole pack as mm -hmm. if you remember, we were flagging down that path and, and we didn't just find one or two, we found, you know, clusters of yes. these larvae, right? They were just everywhere. So that's the strategy of a, of a larval tick. Mm. The, the strategy of a nymphal tick is a little bit similar. They, they tend to stay where the humidity is the highest. And so they tend to get on the animals that are in that same space. So if you're in the Northeastern United States, you that in that space where that leaf litter is and it's humid, you've got mice, you've got chipmunks, you've got certain species of birds that are kind of rooting and browsing through the leaf litter looking for something to eat. And those end up being the animals that these nymphs get on. But if you were in the southeastern United States, those that same space, it turns out that, that because of the dryness, the nymphs go just a little bit lower in the leaf pack. And the animals that they most likely encounter there 
are um, anoles in um, lizards, right? Oh. And it turns out that anoles in lizards aren't- What's an anole? An anole is like a chameleon or oh, something. Oh, so really like one yeah. of those, those little gecko type of yeah, looking exactly. things? Oh, okay. I yeah, exactly. I didn't, so those actually, ticks will go for them? They will. And in fact, that's the one of the most common hosts for larval black-legged ticks in the Southeast. But the good news is that those animals don't carry the germ that causes Lyme disease. So yeah. those larvae feeding on their preferred host don't, they're biting a host that doesn't give them the germs that cause Lyme disease. Whereas in the Northeast, we don't have as many animals and lizards and so forth. And so and the ticks can come up just a fraction higher in the leaf litter where they're going to end up running into mice and chipmunks. And they do carry the germ that causes Lyme disease. And so that's why there's a, actually a difference in the risk for Lyme disease between the South and the North, because the, in, the number of ticks that pick up an infection in the North is much higher than the, than the proportion of ticks that pick up an infection in the South. Because the host, it's all about the Because host. they're on a different host. Right, right. Okay. So then, so then again, so then going kind of back to the protection, that's where treated shoes, socks. Right. So knowing the season that you're right. in right. and knowing where the ticks are in that season. So the larvae are out in August. Let's say you don't want larval bites because they're going to make you itchy. Then you should be wearing treated shoes because that's the first place that those ticks are likely to get on you. And then they'll crawl, they'll crawl up your legs, so you should be wearing treated socks. And, you know, wouldn't be a bad idea in case you didn't have treated shoes or treated socks, maybe to be thinking about wearing treated pants as well. So from the ground up, these ticks are getting, the protection needs to be from the ground up, you know. Um, Insect Shield has a nice variety of, of t-shirts that are treated and that's fine, but the ticks right. have trouble getting getting up to where that treated t-shirt is. It may be good for the mosquitoes, but less less important right. for protecting against or it's ticks. Gonna have, or the it's gonna have easily it's gonna have attached before it gets to the t-shirt. Most Would likely. So yeah. you know, so we just think about where the ticks are and that's how we build our protection. So right. from the ground up for ticks, maybe from the top down from for mosquitoes. Um, would be sort of an easy rule of thumb to think about it. But then but then those nymphs that feed on a chipmunk or a mouse or a bird become the adult stage ticks in the fall. Now, the adult stage ticks don't feed on a mouse. They, they, I've actually trapped thousands and thousands of mice and never found one. Hmm. They feed on a slightly larger animal. The most preferred animal is a white-tailed deer. And so if you think about if you were an adult tick and you wanted to get on a white-tailed deer, you wouldn't stay on the ground because, again, all you would see of that deer going through the woods is these four little pencil points, right, as the deer walks through. Instead, you would climb up just a little bit higher so that you would get on the biggest part of the animal, sort of its haunches or whatever, and latch on. So you'd, you'd have more body mass to, to latch on to as the deer passes through the woods. And so that's where we find the adult stage black-legged ticks up a little bit higher, sort of about knee height. And so if you're trying to protect yourself at that time of year, so that's October and November and into December, and then again in March and April and May when the adult stage ticks are active, you need to be, it's okay if you're wearing treated shoes and treated socks, but the ticks are actually latching on higher up on your pants. And then- they're crawling. If your pants aren't treated, they're crawling up very quickly because they all crawl up towards the head region of their host. And they're going to be up underneath an untucked shirt. So that's why it's important to tuck your shirt in to keep them on the outside. And at that point, your treated t-shirt will be right. a nice area of protection as well. So that, and, the, and the adult ones, the adult ticks, I mean, are they moving faster? Yeah, because they've done this, like they kind of know what they're doing. Do they yeah, well, for one thing, their legs are longer. Right. So they can right. make, they can cover the ground a little right. bit faster, you know, and, and black-legged ticks are fairly slow and methodical as they climb up anyway. They I mean, some people might say, oh, that tick was really moving. If you want to see a tick that really moves, um, this one that we call the Lone Star tick, um, it like 
sprint. Yeah. And so they Have can a be tick race. Good yeah. <laughs> it, they can be on your pant leg and up underneath your shirt in under a minute. And, you know, most people are, you know, a lot of times people will look down and they might see it. That's why we tell people to wear light colored clothing mm-hmm. to help them see ticks that are crawling on them. But if with these Lone Star ticks, you've got to be like constantly looking. So you're missing looking around because yes. you're busy looking at the, for the ticks. So typically, so basically, even though the a deer is not infective, most of these ticks or many of them were already infected or got the like an infection like from the mouse when they were little, when they were in their the kind of nymphal stage. And even though they go feed the deer on the deer later, they already have enough of the Lyme or the other bacteria in them that. Yeah. So if they pick it up as a larva, mm-hmm. they then can, they, you know, they, in growing, they actually completely transform inside of the shell of that engorged larva. And then they emerge out as a, as a nymph. And so then those nymphs are potentially carrying the germs right then. And then when they feed, they can transmit it. Um, And then when the nymphs transform, they transform into the adult stage. They carry the infection through that transformation into the adult stage too. So that's why the, the adult infection rate is what we call it. The number, the proportion of ticks infected is double that of the nymphs because the nymphs have had two chances, two blood meals. They could have picked it up as a larva and then they have some portion of them are infected as a nymph. If that nymph feeds on an infected animal, then it sort of, and it missed its infection the first round as a larva, now it has a second chance to get infected before it becomes an adult. So we tend to see in the northeastern United States and the upper Midwest, about half of the adult stage black-legged ticks are infected with the Lyme disease spirochete. In the nymphs, in the same area, only about 20% or 25% are. So um, there's more nymphs than adults, but and they're smaller, so they're harder to see. So that makes them riskier. And so most people actually get, if they're going to get Lyme disease, they get it usually in the summertime when the nymphs have been biting, as opposed to when the adults have been biting. But the adults actually are quite risky. Um, when you think about one in two ticks that you get on yourself um, in your fall hikes, if you're not paying attention, they're carrying infection. So it's, it's r- riskier. Now, do we find, do you find, so obviously we're talking always about going on hikes and being out kind of in the wilderness where there's other animals. But, you know, like I said, I mean, I'm where I live in like, you know, kind of a suburb. There are deer, you know, I get, if you get up early in the morning, all of a sudden the dog's barking because there's a deer walking down the street. I mean, do, is there concern just like in my yard or in some, like, because there are deer, you know, because we have like a little creek nearby, so... You know, Did one of the things that? about, you know, the, the, you know, people lived in the cities back in the 1930s and 40s, and then they started moving out into the suburbs, wanting to commune with nature. People love that, you know, and I love that. I mean, that's my house is like that as well. And I have actually had a bobcat run through my oh, yard gosh. the other day. <laughs> I've got deer right. regularly. I got more mice and I know what to do with, you know, Chipmunks, they're su- on average in a woodlot. Chipmunks supposedly are um, five to seven per acre. That's what they say. One year in my one acre yard, I was able to live trap 40 chipmunks. So I got way more of these reservoirs than I right. wish I had. <laughs> Good news is I've been able to. Um, reduce the number of ticks so that these animals are, even though they're competent as reservoirs, they're not feeding ticks in my yard because there are no ticks there. So how do I do that? I do a, a yard treatment. And if you use the right kind of product and you use it in the right places, and we teach this with pest professionals how to do this the most effective way, you can actually reduce your exposure to ticks by reducing the number of um reproducing ticks in your yard basically so we kill them rather than so really when anyone is out i mean so the conversation also just needs to be gardening mowing your lawn 
you know, just being out in the yard, throwing, you know, playing catch with the dog. Like you should just protection should be all the time. It should exactly. just be like so, special, you know, hiking and, you know, go on the trail. And so how do we get people to do that is really um, my biggest um, focus. Like we have things that work. People are always looking for the next magic bullet. We have pr- very effective strategies now, but what we need is to have more um, buy-in, more people doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how do we build strategies? First, I think we need to engage people and say, hey, this tick problem isn't just the one from what you heard on the internet or something. It's it's potentially you as well. I mean, we hear through our crowdsourced tick survey People send us pictures of their tick they've encountered, and they often will say, hey, I've lived in this neighborhood in the same house for 20 years or 30 years. This is the first time I've ever seen a tick. What's going on? Well, guess what? We live in a more ticks in more places world, and it's increasingly that way. And you, what you just said, you know, living in suburbia and seeing deer in your backyard, people didn't see that. I mean, think about it. 50 or 100 years ago, if you saw a deer in your backyard, you probably shot it and ate it for dinner, right? Right. Now, no one's shooting them and eating them for dinner. And it's like, so now they're everywhere. You know, that's the big issue with with what we call this whole group of diseases called zoonotic diseases. They come from animals, wildlife, and affect people. You know, humans have had a huge impact on this, not just the animals. What have we done? We've taken away where the animals used to like to live and we've plopped ourselves in that space. And so now we're surprised that we're living with the same things that the animals used to live with. Now we have to live with them too. These things called ticks, uh, you know, we were aghast and think that, you know, what's wrong with the world? You know, why can't I have my cake and eat it too? Well, you can, you just have to build good personal protection. Right. strategies and exactly one you know what thing i think that- it's important to think it's not and also it is the everyday it's the yard i mean it's just getting that it's not it's not like your special like oh only do that when i'm going out for the hike it's uh, or the camping trip it's exactly you know, i'm gonna go do gardening you know and i'm down low and yeah i mean there's i was i was sitting with um friends at dinner once and then there was at the next table there was somebody i i didn't know but that one of the friends knew and so somehow you know, whenever I'm around, the, yes. the discussion oh. always res- comes into ticks. Yes. And so the guy was saying, oh, yeah, you know, we were talking about personal protection and wearing treated socks when you go for, a, you know, a hike. And he said, oh, I have some of those treated socks. And I said, oh, great. You know, and I said, so what's, what, why, why are you getting ticks on you? And he said, well, I, I didn't wear them. I wasn't going on a hike. I was walking my dog. And I'm like, huh. That's kind of the same thing, right. um, you know. So you don't have to be saving your your treated socks for your hike on the Appalachian Trail, which you may do once in your lifetime. When you're walking your dog three times a day in probably the same, if not higher, area mm-hmm. of risk, um, you know, it's really how do we overcome people's thinking about that? That they, you know, one of the ways that that I've done it is one, I, I I know about ticks, right? So getting people to know about the risk of ticks and how it's, it's like pretty much, you know, it's not, I don't know if inevitable is the right word, word, but they, that ticks are potentially in a lot of spots mm-hmm. and they do nasty things. So coming to the appreciate appreciation of that first and foremost, I think is a, is a good, you know, I call that engagement. So I'm engaged in, in this whole idea. I know that ticks are not good for me or my children. And so what can I do? I, I want to protect myself. All right. So now I'm going to step outside and I have my step outside clothes. I usually, when I step outside, I'm mostly going to do gardening, like some brush clearing or something. I'm, I know I'm going to be a, in tick habitat. And so I need to, so I put my tick protective clothes on before I step outside. It's as easy, easy as that. I come back inside, I take my tick protective clothes off, and then I do a quick scan of my skin to see if any ticks have gotten by. I, I really have come, maybe I've gotten a little bit cocky about this, but I find it so effective that I 
hardly ever find an attached tick when I'm wearing my tick protective clothing. So what? Okay. So, I mean, there's a lot more we could go through. I was just thinking about one quick side thing. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, when I was young, 30, 40 years ago, our thing with sun protection was completely different. You know, like we would just help tell sunburn could you get yeah. and how that's changed. So, and I mean, it's, hope- and it, and right. And now that's changed so much. We were, we were, um, in the winter, we were at an indoor pool and this kid was having histrionics because he had forgotten his swim, his swim shirt. Right. You don't need a swim shirt. It, but, you're but inside, they've right? Changed the, exactly. the mentality is really the key. That's what it's, I'm, that right. in my job right. of trying to protect people from tick bites, I'd like to get to that point right. where people have histrionics when they're not wearing their right. treated clothing as the best personal protection. Instead, they're like, there's all of this hearsay. Uh, well, I, I, I want to put some lavender oil on my skin because I like the smell and it keeps the ticks away. Well, yes, it smells nice, but it isn't really very effective at keeping the ticks away. You know, tests that we've done have shown that some of these products really aren't as effective as a tick repellent or a tick killer. But unfortunately, if they're not, they can make, if it's natural, they can make claims that don't have to be substantiated. So people need to be careful of yeah. what a claim is and what is actually a proven claim or just what's yeah. a marketing claim. Well, people all think that when you see a product on the shelf and it says it kills ticks or it repels ticks or something, but like you said, not all of the products actually had to be vetted um, right. by science um, because the the EPA has uh, exemptions for some of these natural products, so we don't, you know, they may say that it's that way, but we don't really know. Right. Um, whereas products that have to go through EPA registration, you know, we do know. Right. Uh, we can, you know, with confidence that they've been tested. Um, some of them may not be as effective as you want them to be, but they are right. still likely to be more effective than you know, going out butt naked without any, <laughs> anything, any protection. Uh, on. Um, all right. Well, one thing, so to, we'll just wrap up though. Case, can you just tell us if, if you did find a tick, your steps. So you find a tick attached quick, just briefly. And, and like I said, we have a lot of information on, on our equipment for ticks. There's a lot of things on your website, um, on tickencounter.org. We have TikToks. We have all sorts of stuff, but go through just, here's what I, I found a tick. What do I do? Right. So finding a tick is really, you know, the first step to open the door to knowing what to do next. And so if you found a tick, a lot of times people aren't prepared for that. So one thing is to sort of be ready, at least in your head. I may find a tick. So if I find a tick, don't just throw it away, like because it grossed you out or flush it down the sink or the toilet, because you don't know what kind of tick it is. And we know that different types of ticks transmit different germs. So the first thing you'd really like to know is, well, I wonder if it's one of those Lyme disease carrying ticks, but I don't know how to tell the ticks apart. Well, guess what? I do. Right. And so you can send me a picture okay. of the tick through our tick spotters program. So on Tick Encounter, our website, there's a found a tick section. It couldn't be clearer, really. Oh, yeah, I found a tick. Click on that button. And you'll come to a, a, a page that allows you to attach your picture, fill out a little little form to tell us a little bit about, you know, where it was and everything. And in less than a day, you'll get back an answer confirming what kind of tick it was, how long it may have been attached, and what it likely could do to you, like what germs it might. And then it also comes with some information about how do I keep this from happening again? you know, leading people towards, okay, it's, you know, I think someone who finds a tick is going to be very engaged. That's like an engagement step to knowing and wanting to do something about it. Those people tend to be the ones that will then seek out wearing protective clothing, for instance, because they don't want it to happen again. Oh, I, I didn't get sick this time, but next time it could be something different. And so they take appropriate actions. So that Tick Spotters program is really our way of trying to be a resource for people that just found a tick. Right. No, that's great. Um, well, thank you. I mean, really, it's, I mean, I think we talked just more about ticks because we talk so much about protecting from ticks and, you know, the different diseases and the bacteria, but actually like learning about 
how the ticks are going about doing their thing. I think the more we know about that can help everyone. And like this, I mean, and actually, you know, I usually have my socks on when I take the dog out for the walks, but <laughs> we have to make sure and making sure every, all the, you know, all the shoes are sprayed, not just our trail shoes. I think that's a good reminder that it's just every day and it should just like you said, it's just part of your, you know, why not and have the, all your sneakers sprayed, not just your head? Exactly. The, that's the nice thing about, about um, the insect shield technology, for instance, is that it makes it possible. Yeah. That you've got the possibility and it. There's no reason not to do it. I mean, if you have a dog that you're walking every day, you, you, you know, our studies have shown that most people protect their pet against ticks. Well, what about yourself? You're, you, you're usually about three feet or so away from that dog. Why not protect yourself too? So if you start thinking, okay, so now, you know, it wasn't too hard to give the dog a monthly chew tablet or something like that. Is it any harder really to take that can of spray. Well, I mean, and, and this could be a whole other podcast a conversation because you, yeah. why is it we just, you know, we're at the vet and I mean, they always ask, okay, so your dog's on some sort of prevention. I mean, that's part. And I was, you know, that's always a question. Any vet, they're confirming that as a good pet parent, I am doing that for my dog, but you know, that's then, but not a conversation for people are going, you know, the kids are going off to school and they have, you know, maybe the school is, you know, kind of in the suburbs and there's the, you know, their animals, the same kind of thing running around. And yet that's not part of like, okay, the kids are going to recess and, or, the, yeah. or, or they're waiting, waiting at the school or waiting at the neighborhood, waiting, waiting at the right. neighborhood corner for the bus right. or walking through the cut but, through path to get to the school or something. But like, like I that. felt like if I went to the vet and said, Oh, Oh, we do, we haven't been keeping yeah. the dog, you know, flea and tick prevention. It'd be like, you're a horrible pet parent and maybe your dog should be taken from you. I mean, that's yeah, almost right. the feeling you get. Yeah. And yet for people, we're not considering these. So it's, uh, it's yeah. something to think about. Really, It is. It? Yeah. Well, thanks for um, talking Thank with me so, today. And yes, hopefully that anybody really that's listening to this will, will be slightly convicted and say, Oh Yeah. I should be doing that. Yes. And all we want them to know is that, yeah, the resources are there and it's actually not that hard to do. Right, exactly. You know, every exactly. time you open the little capsule to put something on your dog, think about, you know, taking a can and spraying your shoes as well. You yes. do that once a month, right. you'll add, add protection against ticks to your life as well as to your dog's life. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. It was really informative. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you.